I now call to order the Society's 2,489th meeting in what is now the 152nd year since its founding on March 13, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends to tonight's PSW meeting and the lectures by three PSW members, Lloyd Mitchell, A.J. Kathari, and Scott Matthews. Before we begin, a few words of thanks. We are grateful to PSW full year series sponsor, PSW member Mike Helton and Helton Associates LLC for their support. Uh, Mike is in the audience, so please let's all give him a round of thank you. Thank you, Mike. And we're also grateful to PSW member Joe Schulman for sponsoring tonight's lecture. PSW has been given a donor match gift by a generous supporter. All contributions from now through January 31 will be matched two to one. For every dollar you give, PSW will receive three dollars, your dollar and two matching dollars, up to a total of $20,000 in matching contributions. And there are just five days left on this offer. So now is a very good time to make a donation and support PSW financially. And trust me, we're going to need that financial support. I'm pleased to note that the three speakers tonight are already PSW members. So <clears throat> on the other hand, some of you are not. And if you're interested in joining, you can access a membership application on the PSW website by clicking on the Join button on the home page at the upper right-hand corner. And if you're here in the Powell Auditorium, you can access the application using the QR code on the tables at the back of the room. Everyone with a genuine interest in science is welcome. All members are entitled to a signed copy of Volume 1 of the Bulletin of the PSW, and if they so choose to wear the ribbon of the society. And if you are a new member and you have not received your copy of the bulletin, please come see me after the meeting. Recording Secretary Scott Matthews will now present the minutes of the 2488th meeting and the lecture by Michael Newfeld on NASA's Artemis mission. Scott. Thank you, Larry. Uh, good evening. On January 12th, 2024, in the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC, President Larry Milstein called the 2488th meeting of the Society to order at 8.02 PM Eastern Time. He began by welcoming attendees, thanking sponsors for their support, and announcing new members. Scott Matthews read the minutes of the previous meeting, including the lecture by Catherine Hoff on nuclear energy and advanced reactor designs. The minutes were approved as read. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Mike Neufeld, senior curator retired from the National Air and Space Museum. His lecture was titled, Back to the Moon to Stay? The speaker began by stating that he was an avid space enthusiast and historian and that he believed that the Artemis space program was likely to survive into the 2030s due to geopolitical and domestic political reasons. Neufeld then delved into the his historical and political context of the US space program post-Apollo. He highlighted the collapse of public support for deep, deep space exploration in the early 1970s. The speaker discussed the development of the space shuttle program in the early 1970s with the approval of Richard Nixon based on both economic and political considerations. Neufeld indicated that while the space shuttle program dominated the 1980s, its limitations became apparent with failed expectations of high flight rates and the Challenger accident of 1986. Despite the setbacks, Ronald Reagan approved the space station in 1983 
The speaker introduced the von Braun paradigm, a fixed path towards deep space exploration, which included the steps space station, moon, Mars, and beyond. Neufeld discussed the fact that while George H.W. Bush had considerable enthusiasm for spaceflight, the cost estimates for a moon Mars program he initially supported exceeded half a trillion dollars, and that the lack of smaller, more affordable options led to the end of his space exploration initiative. The speaker then discussed the Hubble telescope problem and the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster, and how these events further degraded the public image of NASA and eroded public support for space exploration. Neufeld said that at the end of 2011, with the retirement of the space shuttle, the U.S. was without, quote, heavy lift capability. The speaker then discussed the Obama administrations and the origins of the Artemis program. He indicated that this program aims to return humans to the lunar surface, but with a, quote, more sustainable and long-term plan. Artemis includes the development of the Space, space Launch System, or SLS, the Orion rocket, and ultimately a space station in lunar orbit called Gateway. Neufeld commented that while the Artemis program continued under the Trump and Biden administrations, the timeline has become fluid with several initial deadlines already missed. Neufeld briefly discussed missions to asteroids and comets, including DART, Deep Impact, OSIRIS, and Hayabusa. The speaker then turned to more recent developments in space exploration, particularly the accomplishments of the private sector. He discussed the Starship, built by SpaceX, and Blue Moon, built by Blue Origin. He said that NASA is continuing to develop a commercial model for certain components and vehicles, where a private company owns the equipment and charges NASA for its use. Neufeld ended his lecture by noting the combination of domestic political support international collaboration, and the geopolitical competition with China as driving forces behind the Artemis program. He reiterated his belief that Artemis is likely to survive well into the 2030s. The lecture was followed by a question and answer session. One member asked about placing a space station at the Lagrange point as opposed to low Earth orbit. Neufeld briefly described the L points as places where gravitational pull of two objects cancel one another out, but said that none of the proposed space stations would be located at Lagrange points. He did mention that the Chinese Space Agency put a communication satellite at the Earth-Moon L2 point to communicate with a lander on the far side of the moon. A member asked about the possibility of financial instability with private companies jeopardizing upcoming missions specifically citing some of Elon Musk's recent acquisitions. Neufeld responded that SpaceX appears to be, quote, remarkably stable because they are making so much money, unquote. However, he agreed that there is legitimate risk associated with betting on commercial companies. Another member asked about the use of the words to stay, question mark, asking Neufeld, Neufeld how to define what to stay asking Neufeld to define what it means to stay. Neufeld commented that he included the question mark in the title because he is not really sure what it means to stay. He said, quote, prediction is a risky business, especially for a historian. He indicated that his current vision of what it would mean to stay would be to have a gateway space station in lunar orbit, a base on the south pole of the moon, and the ground-based infrastructure to support them. A member asked for more specifics about Gateway Space Station, including a timeline for its launch and deployment. Neufeld said that the first two elements of Gateway were scheduled to launch on a Falcon Heavy in late 2025, but he admitted that he got this information from Wikipedia. He said that there were no plans to use Gateway until at least 2028 or later. A question from the web asked what the current amount of private funding for space exploration was as a percentage of the federal budget. Neufeld responded that he did not know the specific number, but that it was an extremely small fraction. He mentioned that a significant amount of private funding was going into the development of launch vehicles for communication satellites rather than space exploration. The question and answer session concluded with a question asking Neufeld to speculate about fictional events that might have dramatically altered the history of the U.S. space program. 
Neufeld commented that had the Soviet Union landed a man on the moon, it is likely that the US would have responded with increased efforts to maintain our technological superiority in the decades following Apollo. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker and presented him with a PSW rosette, a signed copy of the announcement of his talk, and a signed copy of volume one of the PSW bulletin. He then announced speakers of upcoming lectures, made a number of housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. He adjourned the 2,488th meeting of the society at 10.09 p.m. Eastern time. Temperature in Washington, D.C., 11.1 Celsius. Weather, light rain. Attendance in the Powell Auditorium, 68. Viewers on the live stream, 48, for a total of 116 live views. Views of the video in the first two weeks, 574. Respectfully submitted, Scott Matthews, Recording Secretary. Thank you, Scott. Are there any comments on the minutes? Corrections? If not, I will entertain a motion to accept the minutes as read. Thank you, Bob. Do we have a second? Thank you, AJ. All members in favor? All members opposed? The minutes are accepted unanimously as read and will be posted to the website in due course. For those of you online, if you have any comments on the minutes, please uh, submit them to our corresponding secretary, corresponding sec at pswscience.org. Minutes are accepted as read. And we now turn to tonight's lectures. In a departure from recent practices and with a nod to the society's historical roots, tonight we will hear from three current PSW members. In fact, the society started life as a forum for its own members to discuss their work and report on their adventures, both intellectual and peripatetic. It was the primary means of communication on science in those days. Obviously, a lot has changed in 152 years, not least of which is the wide and quick dissemination of science and technological developments through publications, conferences, and electronic means of communication. But the value of in-person dialogue and getting to know one another is as valuable as it ever was. So in a nod to PSW's history, to learn a bit about what some of our members are up to, and to stimulate a little dialogue tonight, we'll hear three lectures by three PSW scientists. You can hear, see here Lloyd Mitchell on retrotherapy, A.J. Kathari on Astrox Corporation, well, actually on um, molten <coughs> thorium reactors, and Scott Matthews on magnetic mistakes. I'm going to introduce them all before each of their talks in succession, rather than all three at the same time here. So first, molecular biologist and gene therapist, Lloyd Mitchell will be discussing gene editing using the body's own editor RNA transplicing for therapy. Lloyd is founder and CEO of Retrotherapy, a company developing therapeutics for the treatment of genetic diseases based on RNA splicing. Previously, he was a researcher at NIH, where he invented the first affinity-based method for sequencing DNA. Lloyd earned a BS in biochemistry at University of Maryland, College Park, an MS in physiology at Georgetown University, and an MD at the University of Maryland College Park. Now, you may notice that these three speakers have all gotten their degrees at the University of Maryland College Park. Some got two degrees there, and someone got three degrees there. This is pure coincidence. I don't mean to imply any bias in favor of graduates of the University of Maryland College Park, as fine a school as it is. And with that, I will turn the stage over to our first speaker, Lloyd Mitchell. Thank you, Larry. Dr. Mitchell. Yes. OK, so tonight I'm going to address you on uh, how to use the body's own editor to rewrite genes. And in order to do that, um, 
we need to understand a little bit about how your genes work. So this is what's called the central dogma of uh, molecular biology. We all have inherited uh, genes from our parents, which are inherited as DNA. And the genes as DNA, 95% of them have coding regions, which are drawn here as boxes, and we call them exons. And then they have non-coding regions, which are the intervening spaces between the exons. And these are called introns. In order to use a gene, there's a bunch of regulatory machinery that controls each one of them. You each have about 20,000 genes. Um, when they're turned on, a particular gene, it gets copied by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. And we call this process transcription. And the initial copy is called a pre-messenger RNA. It's an exact copy of the DNA with the introns and exons intact. And these little blue lines are indicating that the introns get cut out during a process called RNA splicing. And the final message then is uh, put together with the coding sequences, which then leaves the nucleus. And this mRNA is read by ribosomes, which then uh, use that information to produce a protein. Uh, about, again, 95% of your genes get spliced. And about 95, 90% of them can be spliced different ways. We call that alternative splicing. And the reason uh, that that's important is because your 20,000 genes can be spliced different ways to produce essentially 100,000 different proteins. And uh, so that expands the diversity of what proteins you can make from your 20,000 genes. So now we're going to talk about the traditional way of doing gene therapy. Uh, there's now a number of products that have been FDA approved. And in this particular example, we have your gene, which is controlled by a regulatory mechanism, which looks here as a rheostat, or it actually, for many genes, the regulation or turning on and off of that gene is much more complicated, and it looks more like this soundboard. Needless uh, to say, that gene, when it's expressed, gets copied into a pre-mRNA, makes the mRNA, and that leads, to, in this case, to a defective protein, say, if you have a genetic disease. The idea of gene therapy is to deliver the whole gene, at least the, the, uh, the DNA version of the mRNA, which we call complementary DNA. Uh, that all has to fit into the delivery vector. And that has to come with its own regulatory switches, which tries to recreate what's being regulated over here. That DNA gets then expressed as an RNA. And then that produces the therapeutic protein. And as you can see, both of the defective protein and the therapeutic protein are both made in parallel. And in most cases, that doesn't make any difference. But if you have a genetic disease like Huntington's disease, where the defective protein actually causes a new problem, uh, you need to get rid of it. And adding additional copies of the correct gene isn't going to solve your problem. Needless to say, uh, this is the way that people have been doing gene therapy for about 20 years. Uh, the first person who de delivered a gene like this was actually a member of both the Cosmos Club and PSW. This is Dr. Carl Merrill, who was my mentor at the NIH. And back in 1971, they published a paper which uh, they used a bacterial virus and showed that they could introduce a gene that was missing in a human cell and get expression of that gene. And that caused an uproar, and, uh, but eventually led to the rest of uh, the development of gene therapy. So the way we deliver genes is a very traditional way, which is done often by viruses. Viruses have been delivering their genes payloads for millions of years. And this is a list of a number of different viruses uh, that can be used clinically to um, deliver genes. These regions in blue are parts of the virus that are not necessary. So we can cut them out and then put our own genetic payload in here so we can deliver those. And you can see that a number of these gene products are now uh, approved by the FDA for use in patients. But the problem with gene therapy, again, is that many genes are too big to deliver. Uh, the expression of each gene needs to be properly regulated. Some genes you don't have to regulate. Some genes are it's extremely important to regulate their expression. And then again, adding a new gene may not solve a problem of a gain of function uh, for some of these toxic genetic diseases. So there's a newer technology called gene editing, which solves these problems. 
because you don't have to deliver the whole gene. We only deliver the piece that needs to be rewritten. Uh, the expression of the repaired gene remains under the endogenous control, and uh, dominant negative mutations are corrected. And this slide shows sort of the, the advantages of gene editing. So on the left, we have oops, the uh, gene therapy that I just explained to you a minute ago, where the gene that you delivered is expressed all by itself. On this side, we can deliver a much smaller payload with a smaller regulatory switch. And if you can target the DNA, which you can do with CRISPR and some other technologies, or edit the RNA, you can deliver a much smaller payload. And these genes are not expressed directly. They're under the control of the endogenous regulatory switches. And you just make the therapeutic protein if your efficiency is 100%. So there's you know, many advantages of this. Um, you've probably, many of you may have heard of CRISPR. It's won a Nobel Prize. And recently, two genetic gene therapies have been approved by the FDA, one for sickle cell anemia using CRISPR. It's a bacterial enzyme that um, you can deliver to human cells. It's usually done ex vivo outside of the body. Um, and CRISPR oops, requires three things, though, to make it work. You have to deliver an RNA, which binds to the target DNA. You have to deliver a Cas enzyme, which is quite large, and I call this an elephant. Uh, it has to find its DNA, and then it either breaks the DNA, and you can wreck a gene, or you can insert a new gene. And then if you um, put additional features on top of the, or the back of the Cas, you can deliver other enzymes with it. So CRISPR-Cas can be used to precisely locate an enzyme on the genome and get it to do other things. But this is sort of like adding more things to the back of the elephant. It gets larger and more cumbersome to deliver. And generally, these things have to all be done outside of the body. And there's many cells that you're not going to be editing outside the body, like people don't want to put their brain in a dish and then put it back. <laughs> so gene editing, again, offers the potential to correct many mutations or conditionally express a reporter or a gene that might kill, say, a cancer cell. Um, but the problem with these DNA editors and many of the editors is they have limited application for use in patients. Uh, CRISPR requires if you're going to cut the DNA and insert new code, the cell has to undergo mitosis or divide within about two hours, and also co-delivery of these large components. And there also has been recently found that CRISPR can cut the wrong place in the DNA, and so it can introduce new mutations. And um, so that's the DNA editors. The RNA editors, uh, many of them avoid these problems, but most of them can only rewrite one letter of the code. Um, which is very small. Uh, diseases like cystic fibrosis have about 1,200 different mutations. So you'd need a lot of products, even if you could correct every single one of these mutations. So the solution, we believe, is to use the body's own editor. Uh, it's a technology I invented uh, called RNA transplicing. And we use this to rewrite genes at the RNA level where splicing is happening. And the molecules we use to do this are called RTMs, or RNA transplacing molecules. And their advantages are they can replace all disease-causing mutations in multiple exons. So you only need to develop one or two products to correct all the mutations in most genes. Um, alternatively, if you're targeting a cancer gene or can cancer cell, you could rewrite a cancer gene and turn it into a, a therapeutic gene, like a suicide gene, so the cancer cells kill themselves. Um, the transplicing sequences themselves are small. There are about 200 nucleotides. I'll show you that. So this leaves room for the, the delivery of other large genetic payloads. And they don't require mitosis or co-delivery of other enzymes. So that makes it easier to deliver these in vivo or in patients. They haven't been in patients yet, but uh, that should happen shortly. I don't expect anyone to memorize this table, but this shows some of the advantages of, of transplicing over the other editors. And again, the major ones are we don't require mitosis. They're quite small molecules. Um, they're not antigenic on their own because we're not delivering bacterial proteins. Uh, the off-target events are not permanent because RNA turns over. You can turn a disease-associated gene into a therapeutic. Um, 
whereas the only technology that does that all, otherwise is CRISPR. Um, you can also get transient editing. So the transplacing molecules can be delivered permanently, like by a lentivirus or an adeno-associated virus. So they're permanently in the human cell. And as RNA is made, they get transpliced. But we can be delivered as RNA or as plasmids that don't persist. So if you're treating cancer, the treatment would only persist for a week or so. And if you wanted to treat it again, you'd have to readminister it. And again, we can rewrite large sections of codes. We've rewritten over 4,000 nucleotides at one pop. So that's pretty big. Um, number of products needed is about two for most genes. And if you're treating HIV, this might be important too, because CRISPR-Cas and many of the other technologies have a very limited binding domain. So the guide RNA for CRISPR is about 25 nucleotides. And if there's a mismatch or a couple of mismatches, it won't stick. Uh, our binding domains can be a couple hundred nucleotides, and we can tolerate a few mismatches. So for a disease like HIV, where mutations are occurring all the time, uh, we should be more tolerant of that condition of the mismatches. So again, I'm going to show you this uh, picture of the central dogma. And we're going to focus now on the pre-mRNA, which is spliced. And uh, I'm going to show you how to take advantage of that natural process that 95% of all the genes go through. So this is a complicated diagram of pre-mRNA splicing for a single intron to be removed. So here we have two exons and one intron. This is a simple model of a you know, one intron gene. And um, it actually leaves out much of the complication because there's really about 200 factors that come together to remove a single intron. But splicing starts by the recognition of the upstream beginning of the intron with the binding of a thing called U1-SNRP. The downstream end of the intron is recognized by U2-SNRP. Once they're bound, they get activated. They recruit a bunch of other molecules, which then go through a lot of reactions, which then cut out the intron and splice together the two exons. And um, it's really not important to memorize how splicing works, because you can kind of think of it as a black box. Because if you put these signals, these little sequences of code, which are found at the beginning of an intron and at the end of an intron, these recruit those splicing machinery to come and do the cutting and pasting. So how can you use this to uh, rewrite a gene? Well, uh, this is how an RNA transplacing molecule looks as an RNA. Uh, it has one of those splice sites here, and we can put in a potent one. You know, it strongly binds the, this U2 SNRP at this case, particular instance. Uh, the RNA molecule also has an antisense binding domain because um, RNA is a single-stranded molecule. And, but it wants to be double-stranded. So if you have the complement or the antisense to that, you can get this molecule to bind. So the RTM sticks to its target, has its own splice site. And then downstream of that, it has an exon, which would contain a therapeutic gene, which would be then delivered into the target gene if a transplicing happens. And this is a diagram explaining uh, basically how this works again. So we have our pre-mRNA with a mutation, say, in exon 4. It's a 5-exon gene. The transplacing molecule binds here in intron 3. And it's got its own splice site, which is now proximate to the beginning of intron 3. And it can participate in a splicing reaction. So you know, normally, this gene would be spliced 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If the transplacing reaction happens, we can make it go one, two, three, and then inserting our code. And this code, again, can replace mutations, like, say, an exon 4. Or it can insert a new gene that could lead to a expression of a therapeutic protein, which could, again, kill the cell or image it. Or um, you can do other things with it, too. There's actually three different transplicing reactions that are possible. What I've shown you so far is replacing either the last exon or any combination of exons up to exon 2. This is a 3 prime um, transplicing molecule. 
because the back end of an RNA is called the three prime end and the front end is called the five prime end. But we can also build transplacing molecules that have a five prime splice site, which mimics the beginning of an intron. And so this transplacing molecule can replace exon one or any combination of exons out to the next to last exon. You can also do, have two uh, splice sites in the transplacing molecule and replace a single exon in the middle of the gene, or maybe multiple ones if you want. And for cancer therapy, this type of transplacing molecule might be most useful because it's missing some of the features that RNAs have to have to be expressed. Like there's a cap on the beginning and a polyadenylation tail at the end. Uh, this transplacing molecule that does double transplacing doesn't have that, so it's less likely to be expressed on its own. So if we're expressing a therapeutic toxin gene, um, you know, it's unlikely that the transplacing molecule would be expressed on its own in this case. Um, so one advantage is that the, um, the main vector that people are using for delivering genes in gene therapy now is called adeno-associated virus. And it's got a very small packaging capacity. It can only hold about 4,700 letters. And if you take into account all the required elements that are necessary to make this virus, there's about, um, and as, add the transplacing elements, we only need about 5% of the packaging capacity of this vector to make transplacing work. So we still leave about almost 3,500 nucleotides of payload available whereas CRISPR-Cas needs about three to 5,000 nucleotides to get it to work. So our molecule is a lot easier to deliver. There's now uh, publications showing transplacing for over 31 different disease genes. These include genes to cause AIDS, uh, dementias, blindness, cancer, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, and uh, sickle cell anemia. So there's a number of publications out there demonstrating this works. Um, now I'm going to show you some of the, uh, the proof of concept to date. Um, the first one is uh, for a gene that causes hemophilia. It's called factor eight. And there's a mouse model for this. So in the mouse, there's a mutation in uh, exon 16, the 16th region of code. And this stops the factor eight gene from making a functional protein. So these mice, if you cut them, they bleed to death. Uh, we produced a transplacing molecule that replaced the entire back half from exon 16 through 26 of this gene. When it was injected into mice, it repaired the factor eight gene. And uh, if you cut their tails of the treated mice, uh, in the first experiment, eight out of 10 of them survived. And in the second experiment, all 12 of the treated mice survived, whereas most of all the control mice died or bled to death. Another gene that we've worked on is the Huntington's disease gene. So this is a, is a de dementia that you get uh, inherited from one of your parents. Uh, Woody Guthrie had it. Um, all the mutations for this particular gene are located in the very first exon of this gene. So the strategy is to replace exon one with a correct sequence, and hopefully that solves the problem. So we've produced a transplacing molecule. This shows this sequence that uh, we've replaced exon one. We've put a couple of silent mutations in this exon, and it's spliced onto the endogenous exon two. So now the sequence is corrected. A group in uh, Missouri has also done this, and they've shown at the RNA level, this is a, a gel showing production of the transplaced RNA. And they got about 15% correction of the RNA at, in this particular uh, study. But they only tested about 11 different molecules. And uh, that's pretty good um, results for just uh, you know, trying 11 different things to see if it would work. They also tested cells from patients that had Huntington's and they got a 50% correction in their metabolic activity, and also um, a 50% better improvement of survival. And that's shown in these two figures here. I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because we don't have a lot of time and to, to explain all the uh, functions of each of these models. 
Um, this is a model we built of um, papillomavirus, which is the cause of cervical cancer. It kills hundreds of thousands of women around the world every year. And what we did is we targeted a conserved region of one of the virus uh, sequences that's required to cause cancer. And um, what we did is we picked up um, the start codon, because all genes have a start codon, um, by transplacing in a lightning bug gene that was missing the start codon. And when we did transplace it, then we produce an enzyme called luciferase, which is a lightning bug enzyme. If you add the substrate, then with this functional enzyme, the cells will glow. So when the transplacing molecule was introduced into mice, uh, you can see uh, this is a pseudo-colorized uh, picture of photons coming out of the mouse and shows that we did transplace into the papillomavirus and were able to generate luciferase. So rewriting the papillomavirus. Um, another gene that's involved in cancer is called P53. Mutations of P53 are actually involved in about 50% of all cancers. Um, P53 is sort of the guardian of the genome. It protects uh, cells that, if they get other mutations, it makes them either stop growing or die. So a group in China repaired um, P53 in a, a liver tumor cell line and got uh, some correction. And uh, this shows that when they treated these mice, their livers uh, weren't as large as the ones that had cancer, which is a sign that you know, the liver cells or the tumor cells are killing themselves. We did the same thing with a gene that's involved in leukemia. They, they have um, patients often get mutations over here in intron 12. We replaced the entire coding sequences of exons 10 through 14 and put that into human cells that were then grown in, in mice, human cancer cells. And uh, the treated mice, 83% um, of the mice survived who were treated versus all the controls had died. And down here is a picture of their spleens of the treated ones. And you can see they're much smaller than the non-treated ones. So these other ones have cancers in them. So we think that transplacing offers uh, a great way to treat cancer because we can target not only genes that are causing the cancer, but we could target genes that are expressed by cancer cells. So there, it's, some cancers are in tissues that are, I would call non-essential, like prostate or pancreas or ovary or breast. You know, if the surgeon can remove that tumor in situ, then you may be cured. So. The problem is that uh, these tumors create metastases, and many times these cells that are metastatic still express the same genes. So we could target those. And then there's a whole set of other marker genes that don't get expressed in cancers, uh, sorry, in normal cells, and don't make a protein. Like in prostate, there's a gene called PCA3. It makes an RNA, but it doesn't make a protein. So those are potential targets. And now, just go over uh, quickly some other ones. Um, there's a, tauopathies are involved in many forms of dementia. Uh, there's two different forms of um, microtubule associated tau. One's called 4R, one's called 3R. And these different um, types of dementia, like frontotemporal dementia, involves an excess of the 4R form, which contains an extra exon. And uh, Pick's disease is involved with an excess of 3R, which is missing one of the exons. And this is a diagram that shows, essentially, that here's the 4R form of the gene with all four of these exons here, the R exons. And this one has got only three forms. So there's a mouse model that has um, of tau with the human gene in it. And in this particular case, the mouse makes an excess of 3R tau. So a group in Cambridge, England, made a transplacing molecule that inserted extra exon 10, or the 4R form. And what they were able to show was in the mouse model, uh, the untreated mouse here has excess 3R form compared to 4. When they treated the mice, they got roughly equivalent levels of 4R. And that's cool. But uh, they also showed in two different studies that when they treated the mice, um, 
at the age of two to three months before they developed symptoms. They prevented the pathology of the, of the disease. And even more important, when they treated the mice at six months of age, they were able to show that the mice, uh, they were able to restore function. So they were able to restore both the protein being phosphorylated, uh, recognition of um, novel objects, and also the functioning of the brain. And I'm going to skip this, this particular one and just point out there's a, a company that I helped, uh, get, I guess, get started called Acidian, which is, was founded by a woman, Jean Bennett, who got the first FDA-approved gene therapy. And they're filing, they say they're filing for uh, an investigational new drug for testing a transplacing molecule to treat blindness sometime this year. And, uh, well, I'll just specific, go over quickly um, how we develop these transplacing molecules. So now, what we do in, uh, in the past, we, we made guesses on how, which part of the transfer or the, the pre-mRNA is the best place to target. Nowadays, we use, um, uh, we're using computer algorithms to try and predict which part of a gene is the best to target. We then make a library of a million different transplacing molecules that target that particular region. And we can screen them using a fax cell sorter and then find functionally the best molecules that hit this gene and rewrite it. And um, that's shown here because if we're rewriting a particular gene, the cells will turn green and they'll also turn red. But if they hit the wrong gene, they can also turn red. So what we do is we try and recover the cells that express gene green and also red, and exclude the cells that turn red. And we use a fluorescent activated cell sorter, which is basically a, a fancy squirt gun with lasers and detectors, and it can recover single cells from it. And uh, at the end, we hope to have the best molecules for uh, rewriting genes. And I think I should stop there. We will have questions at the end. We're going to do something a little odd to have all three of our speakers up on the stage at the same time, even though they're talking on diverse subjects. But I thought it might be more fun that way. So our second speaker will be physicist Scott Matthews, and he'll be talking about magnetic mistakes and their correction. And his recent work showing that the ascending branch of a magnetic hysteresis loop can, in fact, cross over the descending branch, and vice versa, despite 80 years of thinking that it could not. Scott currently is a research physicist with the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. He has over 40 years of R&D experience in private industry, academia, and government laboratories, and he is an author on more than 80 scientific papers. He earned a BS in physics and an MS and PhD in materials engineering at the University of Maryland College Park. Scott. Thank you, Larry. <clears throat> Good evening. So tonight I'd like to talk to you about a little known magnetic phenomenon that is called a hysteresis branch crossing. This phenomenon was first predicted on the basis of theory in 1935 by uh, a German guy um, who uh, nobody read his paper. Um, and the phenomenon was never reported in the literature until very recently. Um, the, Perhaps a more interesting thing about this particular phenomenon is that within about 18 years of the original publication, it was widely determined in, in all of magnetism that this phenomenon was impossible. It was forbidden. Um, it was determined that this phenomenon violated the laws of thermodynamics and therefore could not happen. Um, that idea held until 2020. Uh, when my group at the Naval Research Lab published this paper um, in Nature Scientific Reports on the hysteresis branch crossing. So what I'd like to do tonight is I'd like to kind of give a, 
a background or introductory lesson on magnetism in the hopes that if you can understand a couple basic concepts in ferromagnetic materials, you'll be able to understand what the hysteresis branch crossing is. Um, and you'll be able to understand maybe why people decided that it was impossible and that violated the laws of thermodynamics. And then perhaps most importantly, I can convince you that in fact it does not violate any fundamental law and it's a completely robust and reproducible phenomenon. So here are the ideas that I would like to explain to you. Um, I think that if you have a basic understanding of these three concepts, magnetization, hysteresis, and anisotropy, you can understand what a hysteresis branch crossing is. And then hopefully you can also understand why it was thought to violate the second law and why it doesn't. Um, and then I'll make some concluding remarks about mistakes and how they get fixed in science. Okay, so first, magnetization. So it should be relatively clear that if you go pick up an ordinary nail and you try to use that nail to pick up paper clips, you will not be able to pick up the paper clips with the nail. The nail is not magnetized. It should also be clear that if you wrap a coil of wire around the nail and you run a current through that coil of wire, the coil of wire will create a magnetic field and in some way that magnetic field will magnetize the nail. And now you can pick up paper clips with it. When you disconnect the wire from the battery, you kill the magnetic field being created by the solenoid coil. And in most cases, the nail will go back to being unmagnetized. It will have zero magnetization. Now there are some situations where if you put enough field on a nail, that even after you remove the current from the solenoid coil, the nail will remain magnetized. It will become a permanent magnet. So that's basically really all you need to know about magnetization, is that certain materials, and in particular I'm gonna be talking about ferromagnetic materials, they can be magnetized by an external magnetic field, and in some cases, they can be permanently or spontaneously magnetized. If you want a more rigorous definition, we would define the magnetization as being the magnetic moment per unit volume. So if you think of a tiny little magnet as like maybe a tiny little compass needle, that tiny little compass needle has a magnetic moment associated with it. And the number of magnetic moments per unit volume is telling you how much magnetization you have. Okay, so the next thing you need to know about magnetization is that we know how to measure it. It's a very simple thing to measure. In most cases, we would use something called a vibrating sample magnetometer. And you don't need to worry about what it is or how it works. You just need to know that this is a standard laboratory technique and we can take ferromagnetic materials and we can measure the magnetization as a function of the conditions under which the measurement is made. So the next topic is hysteresis. And hysteresis means literally depending on what came before. If you like, hysteresis means any physical phenomenon that depends on its history. Its current state is not only controlled by whatever the variables at the time are, but that somehow the history that it's been through um, affects its current state. So the graph that you see here is sort of your standard hysteresis loop. On the x-axis, we're gonna have the external magnetic field. This is the field that we are applying to the sample. And when the magnetic field is applied to the sample, the sample responds by becoming magnetized. So if we start off at zero magnetization and we start ramping the field up in the positive direction, what will happen is the sample will become magnetized and eventually it will saturate. Eventually it will be fully magnetized in one direction and increasing the field in that direction further doesn't cause any more magnetization. Perhaps the more interesting thing about this is that when you ramp the field back down again, it does not go back down to zero. Um, it, it goes back at zero field to a point that we would call the remnants, so it has some finite permanent magnetization associated with it. So this is how we make a permanent magnet. And this hysteresis loop is sort of like the characteristic signature of a ferromagnetic material. Now, we generally refer to this branch, 
going from a large negative field up to a large positive field as being the ascending branch of the hysteresis loop because the field is increasing. And similarly, if we start at a high positive field and we ramp the field down and negative, we call that the descending branch. Um, so that's a little hint of what's to come. So the next concept is this concept of anisotropy. And anisotropy means quite literally not the same in all directions. So you can imagine that if I had an iron sphere and I put it in some system like a VSM to measure its magnetization, to measure its hysteresis loop, I would get a certain curve. And if then I took that sphere and I rotated it through an arbitrary angle and measured it again, you would expect to see the exact same thing. Um, it should be invariant with respect to rotation. But you can imagine that if you had a piece of iron that looked like this, and you made one measurement along the long axis of the ellipsoid, and another measurement along the short axis of the ellipsoid, that you would see very different behaviors in the magnetization, or very different shapes in the hysteresis loop because of these differences in direction. That is the definition of magnetic anisotropy. The magnetic properties in one direction are different than the magnetic properties in another direction. So in most magnetic systems, we refer to these axes as being an easy axis and a hard axis. The easy axis is the axis that becomes fully magnetized, magnetized to saturation, at the lowest field. And the hard axis is the direction along which the sample becomes fully magnetized, saturated, at the highest field. So these would be sort of classic curves for an easy axis and a hard axis. So basically, I think that that's all you need to know about a hysteresis branch crossing to know what it is. And I'll, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, but what, I, what I'd like to see if I can express to you is why it is that people decided that the crossing of the branches, having the ascending branch cross over the descending branch, or the descending branch cross over the ascending branch, why they decided that that was impossible and that could never happen. So first, what you have to understand is that the magnetization and the applied field are what we would call conjugate work variables. In other words, if you're going to drive one of those, you're going to change one of those quantities in order to create a change in the other one, it takes work to do that. You have to expend energy to do that. So it turns out that in a ferromagnetic system, you can apply a field. And as you apply a field and magnetize the sample, the sample is becoming more and more magnetized. You're putting energy into the system. Now, if you're very tricky about the way you set it up, you put some the right coils in the right places in the right way, you can now turn off that external magnetic field, and the sample will go back to some other condition without an external field, and you can then pull energy back out. You can harvest the energy back out when you turn the field off. However, if you do this process over and over again, and you go from positive saturation to negative saturation and back again, each time you do it, you will have to expend energy. If you harvest the energy that comes back out when it demagnetizes, you always get less energy out than you put in. You, you, you have to put more energy in than you get out, otherwise you violated the laws of thermodynamics. <clears throat> And so it turns out that with any hysteresis loop like this, that the area that you have inside this curve is proportional to the energy loss. Area in all hysteresis curves are proportional to energy loss. And so you can see now that if the ascending branch crosses over the descending branch, the area enclosed somehow becomes a negative area. And because a positive area represents energy loss, when it crosses over, it represents energy gain. And so people looked at this and said, well, wait a minute. If the ascending branch crossed over the descending branch and we're getting energy back out, we could just cycle the field back and forth over that region. And each time we cycle that field over the crossed region, some energy would come out. And we just made a perpetual motion machine. We just have an infinite energy generator. And they said, therefore, this cannot happen. The crossing of hysteresis branches is forbidden by the laws of thermodynamics. OK, so here is a picture. This is not real data. This is not uh, measured data. This is actually a numeric solution to a simple magnetic model that's called the Stoner-Wolfarth model. 
And what I'm showing on here is I'm showing the hysteresis curves that you would get. This is the magnetization that we measure as a function of the applied magnetic field for three different orientations. And the angles that are given here are the orientation with respect to the hard axis. So if I'm at 80 degrees from the hard axis, I'm way off the hard axis, I'm close to the easy axis, I get this great big hysteresis loop with this great big area inside it representing energy loss. As I start to rotate my sample so that the hard axis of the sample becomes closer and closer to the axis of the applied magnetic field, what happens is that hysteresis loop begins to collapse down. It gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And in fact, if we were go to go right to zero degrees, the magnetic field directly aligned on the hard axis, this system would become completely reversible. There would be no area inside the hysteresis loop, and there would be no energy loss in magnetizing and demagnetizing it. However, if you don't go to the hard axis, but you just get really close to the hard axis, in this case I'm showing two degrees off the hard axis, you can see what happens up here. You can see that the red, which is the ascending branch, very clearly crosses over the blue and then snaps back. And there's an identical phenomenon on the other side, where the descending branch crosses over the ascending branch and again snaps back. And so in those two little regions, you have this negative area representing energy generation. So this is now real data. So what you see on this graph is that the solid and dashed lines are a particular type of stoner wolfarth model that we came up with and solved. Technically, we would call this a temperature-dependent distributed stoner wolfarth model. And so we solve it numerically, and we get the solutions. And overlaid, all the little open uh, triangles and circles are the real data. And in this case, what we're looking at is two components of the magnetization. So the magnetization is actually a vector, right? We normally, on a regular hysteresis curve, we're only looking at one component, just looking at the magnitude of that vector. But there are certain VSMs that can measure both components simultaneously. And in this case, we measure and calculate the magnetization in both directions. And so there's the data, and there's the model. And that's a pretty good fit. Um, OK. So some people might look at that data and say, well, wait a minute. You've only got two or three dots in the crossed region. And so maybe you didn't really show the hysteresis branch crossing you know, as, as you know, in, in detail. So we went back and we did it again, and we did it with a much finer field step. And so this is just a zoom in of what we get. And again, solid lines represent the model, and the open symbols represent the real data. And again, um, um, the hysteresis branch crossing matches the model. The experimental data and the model seem to work really, really well. So here's why this is not a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. When you get to the hysteresis branch crossing, when you get to the point where the branches cross over, you must first traverse the normal region in the hysteresis loop. There's a lens shape or lenticular region in the middle of that hysteresis loop that represents positive area, therefore energy loss. And it is just the area in these two little cross regions that represent energy gain. And so the second, law of the, the second law of thermodynamics basically says that around any full cycle, if you go around a full cycle, you must lose energy. You cannot get extra energy by going around a full cycle. And so in order to see that crossed region, you have to first traverse the ordinary region. And when you traverse the ordinary region, you have lost energy. So as long as the area in the normal region of the hysteresis loop exceeds the area in the sum of the two crossed regions, there is no violation of the second law of thermodynamics. And here we basically show that by doing what we call a minor hysteresis loop. So first we saturate this thing negatively as far as it'll go, and then we ramp the field up positively drawing out the ascending branch of the hysteresis loop. And as we draw out the ascending branch, it jumps over the descending branch, and then we saturate, and then we run back down 
to here, bringing the field slightly smaller, and then we rerun it positive again. And what you see is, is that the crossed region does not reproduce. If you've gone part way around the hysteresis loop and you come back and go over it again, it's not there anymore. The only way that you can get the branch crossing to occur again is to drive the sample into negative saturation, which means by definition, you have covered the normal part of the hysteresis loop. So there's no variation. Um, uh, there's, no, there's no violation, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so it turns out that this is a very reproducible phenomenon. We have dozens and dozens of samples. We've made hundreds and hundreds of measurements, and it shows up again and again. It is a completely robust and reproducible phenomenon. And then very recently, we found the exact same phenomenon in a completely different magnetic system. This is a different magnetic material on a different substrate, put down using a different method. And sure enough, it shows the hysteresis branch crossing beautifully. So the fact that this is showing up in multiple magnetic systems, multiple different magnetic materials, leads us to believe that this phenomenon is actually way more common than people ever thought. So my conclusions, what is my conclusion? You know, science makes mistakes. I mean, this, this was a mistake. This was an improper application of the second law of thermodynamics to hysteresis. That mistake was accepted by the whole magnetics community. And the result was, was believed and accepted. I can show you hundreds of publications and even textbooks which say the ascending branch cannot cross over the descending branch. This is an unphysical phenomenon that cannot happen. And 85 years later, it turns out, nope, that's a mistake. We can fix it, and it's now fixed. So sometimes it takes a while, but science usually fixes its mistakes. That's all I have. Thank you. Our third speaker is aerospace engineer A.J. Kathari, and he will be discussing thorium molten salt reactors for net zero and clean energy. A.J. is president and founder of Astrox Corporation, an aerospace R&D company located in the D.C. area. And he's <clears throat> He has been principal investigator on more than 30 Air Force, DARPA, and NASA contracts, including for hypersonic scramjet vehicles and reusable rockets. And he's an author on more than 45 professional publications. AJ is also a man of many talents. He's an accomplished actor and a member of the Screen Actors Guild. And for those of you who don't know, getting a SAG card is a very, very big deal in the acting world. And he is an artist whose paintings are offered on the Saatchi Gallery website and is, are currently showing at the Watergate Gallery here in DC. AJ earned a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Physics at Bombay University and an MS and PhD in Aerospace Engineering at Guess Where. University of Maryland College Park. AJ, please. Thank you, Larry. Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming here and, uh, and, uh, and listening to all of us. Uh, very interesting talks so far that um, I'm going to talk about, obviously, nuclear power. Um, nuke is not a four-letter word, actually. <laughs> uh, it's the, the, the reason for this is that we have, as, as, uni as, as this Earth, as the world, as humanity, we have problems. And the problems are uh, not just climate uh, change and other, you know, uh, CO2 and all that, but we also are going to have real energy deficit problem, which we cannot solve just simply by renewable, uh, you know, solar wind, etc. 
for the rest of the world and for us even. We have to find some other way or we can't get out of this. And we need energy. This is the energy. The energy is going to be needed for Lloyd's work, for your work, for, for everybody's work. Energy is going to be needed for everything now and in future. So I think that we really don't have any choice here. And the reason for that is what I'm going to outline. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the nuclear power. Uh, but I'm going to specifically talk about one particular type of nuclear power, which is this thorium molten salt reactor, which I think is, is the best possible solution. So let's go to the next slide. So here is, you know, I, I mean, I said that nuke has, uh, uh, has been, you know, downgraded and treated badly, et cetera. I mean, look at this slide here. We have, we have uh, on the left here, on the left here, we have the fatalities uh, that have occurred because of various different, um, you know, energy produ production, starting with coal, oil, uh, and other things, and the nuclear, nuclear is here at the end. Um, it's very small compared to other energy sources, very small, and this includes 62 from Chernobyl, and 61 from Chernobyl, and one from Fukushima. Nobody died, of course, at Tiam Island, as you know. Uh, so that includes all that. This here is, you know, more about the pollution part of it. And so what does, what does the pollution, who, which, which energy does the most amount of pollution? And below here, you see this on the left-hand side is the same thing as which I'm talking about here. And on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, there also the number is very, 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 very small. It's really quite amazing how small it is. And then you look at this, uh, this side here. This side here, this is another really very interesting thing, which is that if you were to really actually look at the amount of area that would be required by various different energy sources like wind and solar and everything, the nuclear is the smallest, smallest, and it's right there. Another thing about nuclear is that it's a capacity factor, which means how long it works before it shut down for some reason or the other, like wind or solar or something like that, which, which has you know, very small uh, capacity factor, 24, 20, 33%. Nuclear has 97, 93% capacity factor. So it works 24, 7, 365. So considering all of these things here, now let's go to the next problem. What is the major problem that we have with present-day nuclear? The present-day nuclear are all PWRs, which are pressurized water reactors. So pressurized with, in light water or, or heavy water, it doesn't matter. All of them require very, very high pressure so the, the, the water doesn't boil off into steam and just you know, um, goes away. So that pressure is 150 to 200 atmosphere pressure. And you see all these domes, and they are you know, very thick domes, and that's the reason for that. So that's those, those um, problems, that 150 to 200 uh, pressure, atmospheric pressure, creates the problem of possible blow up, possible uh, leak, all those kinds of things. Then, so these thick, uh, thick uh, pressure containment walls also have to be built, obviously. And then, you know, you give a contract to a company, and that company will start, you know, charging you arm and leg, and you can't do anything about it because they, they are the sole contractor for that particular area. So that's another problem. And they are, you know, greedy. <laughs> 
Um, so it's a problem. Uh, so now we have these small modular reactors, the SMRs, that can solve that problem, which is that you know, you're not going to have to worry about the one contractor. All these SMRs are built in factories, and then they are uh, sent to different. But the problem is that the SMRs are also working. So far, there's a company called NewScale in Washington is working on that. And that's also pressurized water reactor. That's wrong. That's the, way, that's the reason why it failed in Idaho and Utah State. So instead of doing all that, and then of course we know that the U-235 uranium and U-238 combination creates a lot of waste products too. What if we can solve all those problems? Don't throw the baby out with whatever, 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 which I don't want to say. But we can solve all those problems. How about that is a solution, and we can. We can do that with this molten salt reactor that I'm going to you know, mention, to talk about today. All right, so <clears throat> the evolution of nuclear power, I'll just go through this very, very fast, which is that we have, you know, we have so far had um, uh, the generation one, two, three, three plus, reactors, and now we have generation four reactors that we are coming up with. And the generation four reactors have six different types of reactors that we have. Uh, <clears throat> the one on the top, uh, top right, you can see what happens when the neutron comes and hits the nucleus of, uh, of uranium in that case, and, and it splits. So that's there. Now, we have been looking <clears throat> like like this, everywhere, and the and the elephant in the room is, as you can see, is nuclear. We are not looking at that. We're looking at everything else. It's a silly thing, really silly thing that we are doing or not doing. So we should we need to uh, do that. And the, the, the way that we do that is. So these are the okay. So these are the generation six, generation four, generation four reactors. Okay, generation four reactors. Four different, uh, six different types. I don't have to go through all of them. There are high temperature gas reactors, high temperature um, liquid reactors, and you know all different uh, five different types here on the top. And on the one on the red is the best one, which is the molten salt reactor. Why can't we just simply, instead of keeping the fuel separate, why can't we, I mean, try so fuel or any other fuel separate like that? Why don't we just mix, dissolve the fuel in some liquid? In this case, what happens is that liquid is flibe, which is fluoride, some kind of a, some form of fluoride, and uh, lithium and beryllium. We mix it together. We keep it, we, and then you have to heat it very, very high. It's like 450 degrees centigrade. Only then it will melt. And then you dissolve that fuel, which is an oxide of uh, thorium, into that. When you do that, you have, you have best of both worlds, which is that you have the fuel in there. You have a coolant with that, full, um, with that fuel. And you also have an actually a fissioning generation um, uh, liquid. So you have the best of both worlds, and we are not doing that. We are doing everything else, this country, I mean. <laughs> we are doing everything else except that. I don't, I just don't know why. I have a, um, 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 an item here which says that uh, if you have, and when we have fusion, sure, these things will fall off. But I think for fusion to be available in a controlled manner, controlled fusion, not what, you know, you've heard of this National Ignition Facility, NIF, that reached, you know, um, a break-even point. That really was not obviously a break-even point, obviously. It was 300 times more energy coming out of the, out of the uh, wall. It, but it was also not controlled. It was also not a chain reaction. And without that, it's nothing, it's useless. So at this point in time, 
all we have is fission, and this is the best vision that we have. This is, we have, we have, a, we have a lot of it available in this country. And here is the chart of that. How much do we have? We have 600,000 tons of thorium in this country. One ton of thorium, one ton of thorium is equivalent in terms of energy to five million barrels of oil. It's absolutely unbelievable. One kilogram of thorium, one kilogram of thorium will give you the same amount of energy that you will get from uh, three million ton, three, three and a half million ton of coal. Why do we need coal? Why do we need fissile, uh, fossil fuel or anything else actually? They can all be small part of the whole game, whole system or something, but this has to play a major role. If, if we can do that, we can help solve many of our problems. So um, this is what it looks like. This is what the, on the right, you will see, this is what the reactor looks like. On the left is uh, where you have a, sorry, you have a, you have a liquid form here of thorium. Thorium, as it comes out, is like this. And it's a liquefied, it's like this. It's like, you know, 650 degrees centigrade, something of that type is what uh, the temperature goes to. This is where the reactor is. The yellow pipes there are where, where this liquid is flowing through. And it flows through to a heat exchanger, and the heat exchanger, the other heat exchanger does not have thorium or uranium in it. And so that one is a, just a regular salt, fluoride salt, or any other salt. And that goes through and that powers turbine. And we know, you know, we, we power the turbine using Rankine cycle or Brayton cycle. And that's how we get power. So we can do that with this. How does it work? How does it happen? Now, let me just show you here a little bit about what, uh, what happens here. Here is, here is your thorium atom. It is 232 neutrons plus protons. And uh, its atomic number is 90, which means it has 90 protons and 90 electrons. If you bombard that with one more neutron, that becomes 233, uh, thorium 233, which is here. And then it beta decays, means it gives off an electron over next 22 minutes or so. And it becomes protactinium. When it gives up, it, it changes, obviously. When it gives up the electron, it changes the atomic number. And it becomes protactinium 233. Still remains the same atomic weight. And then you let it stand for 27 days or so, which is the half-life, actually. And then it becomes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, it becomes uh, um, it becomes uranium two thirty three, and then if it gets more one more neutron, that fissions. So thorium is is uh, fertile, but not uh, not fissionable. It cannot fission, and so it is very safe. I hold it in my hand. If I die in two days, <laughs> let someone know. <laughs> but this is thorium. It's very safe. It has half-life of actually 15 billion years. So it's the beginning of the universe. You know? So anyway, it's it's absolutely amazing thing. And 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 so it's it's easy to handle. It's easy to mix with all these things, and then you create the uranium-233 and that fissions. When it fissions, it gives out the amount of energy it gives out per neutron is 200.1 MeV, which is almost the same as what uranium-235 does when it fissions. So you've got the best of both worlds here. And then um, uh, it creates, it, it breaks up into xenon and uh, strontium, and those are easily um, handleable uh, things. Here you can see again that uh, <clears throat> the world electrical need is about 
55 times 10 to the 9 gigajoules per year. This means that 667 ton of thorium can fulfill this need. Uh, this means that <coughs> covering the inefficiency of uh, energy conversion, it may be two, three, two to three times, but this also means that um, this much is enough to power United States with its 600,000 um, ton of thorium for 600 years. What, do you, what more do you want? No. It's, it can be done, it is possible to do it, and, and it doesn't, okay, so let me go get a little bit more into detail about, um, so the thorium is abundant on land, it is actually three to four times more than uranium. Uranium is mostly uranium-238 also, it's not uranium-235. So you have to separate them out, you have to, uranium-235 is only 0.7%. So compared to that, which is feasible, uh, compared to that, um, uh, thorium is actually 500 times more. You know? uh, so thorium is fertile but not feasible, as I showed before. <laughs> um, the pollution is a big problem, as far as I'm concerned, it's a huge problem, and that this will help the pollution part also. Um, this will work close to sea level atmospheric, yes, I forgot to mention that. This works at sea level atmospheric pressure, it cannot blow up. So it's not possible to blow, blow up that thing. It does not not possible to, um, so the meltdowns cannot occur. And there is another reason why the meltdown cannot occur, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But uh, it works there, and the conversion efficiency is also higher because the temperature is higher. So conversion efficiency is like 50 to 60% instead of 30%, which is what we have now with the present day nuclear. And the, the the TMSR, this uh, thorium, day, will burn up about 90 to 99 percent of what you put in. Almost 99 percent of the thorium gets converted into uranium-238, and it burns up. So hardly any waste left. Also, what more do you want? No. <laughs> Again, um, so that's and then whatever is left, one percent, are actinides. Now those actinides are useful for uh, medical treatment, which I'll show in a second also. So, uh, and it can be designed in such a way that uh, in the beginning, and it'll, it'll, use, it'll have to use some, to, uh, some neutrons from um, the waste products that we have already. So we can eat that waste products that we already have also at the same time. So there's just so many possible advantages. There are some disadvantages also. There are some disadvantages also, and so those are material buckling, which I just mentioned here, which is that you have to start with something else, which we can, it's not a big deal. And half-life of uh, pr protactinium is different from, uh, you know, you have to, you have to make, make sure that you separate them. So radiation protection has to be done also. And the problem is that the research in thorium energy is politically restricted so far, and it should not be. There should be a lot more funding for something like this. You know. uh, radiation problem, the gamma radiation problem is dangerous, but good for proliferation pre prevention. Also, I don't want to go through this uh, too much in detail here due to the time limit. Um, <clears throat> separation of protactinium-233 and and uranium-233, which has been formed, which are formed simultaneously, have to make, actually, you know, they are formed by, there is an outer layer, an outer layer is full of thorium with, uh, of course, molten salt, and the inner layer is going to be full of uranium-233, and so the outer layer has to be, um, you know, is, is, uh, uh, is a, a, attacked by, by neutrons, and it converts into the protactinium and other things that I mentioned. Uh, but you cannot allow it to continue to, to uh, take one more neutrons because it creates a, a problem. And so you have to take that out, but that can be chemically separated and done. So and act, um, the actinides, the 1% that is left, is a lot of it is technetium. And technetium is, of course, used for all kinds of you know, imaging and medical uh, issues and problems. So 
that's also possible to get out of this thing. It's just all in all, lots of pluses here. Here is a reactor that I have designed on the top here. Um, this one, the reactor and heat exchanger that I've designed. So this is one possibility. It's only like, you know, this is a 26 megawatt thermal thorium uh, reactor. It's only like four meter, five meter long. And, you know, the, very small. It's, it's uh, usually very small. I mean, look at this here. This is Thorcon. This is, a, this is a company out of Denmark. And that company is working with Indonesia to put up their, put up the plants there. <clears throat> and if you look at this picture here on the left, left bottom here, this is how much coal is needed per day, every day, every day. And on the other hand here, it's hard to see, I have to read here the numbers, but it's, it requires uh, 200 ton uh, uh, over many six years or eight years or something, I can't read it too well, but this one requires thousands of tons a day. So it's just absolutely mind-bogglingly different and so much better, so much better. And then here again, on, the, um, on this side, you will see the size. This is a coal power plant, which is 135 meter wide and uh, you know, it's quite tall. And this is the power plant with the thorium reactor. It's 40 feet, 40 feet wide. It requires, it will take up so much smaller space, so much, I mean, there's no coal pollution, pollution due to coal. Coal should be gone, fossil fuel should be gone slowly and should be replaced with something like this. These are some of the other brilliant designs that some other people have come up with. And these are also very good designs. This is uh, a, what is called a onion design by another company in Thorcon in um, uh, Denmark, I think it is, yeah, Denmark. And this is their idea of MSR, which is um, molten, I mean, sorry, SMRs small modular reactors, they'll make, they are going to be able to make one reactor a day, 100 megawatt reactor per day. And these are all, you know, saved and kept here, as you can see here. The, the, these are all in a series and then, you know, um, and connected to turbines and other ways of doing it. This is another company right here in, DC, uh, in Washington, I mean, sorry, USA, in Alabama called Flybe Energy, which is this kind of a design. This is another company. Uh, this is Thorcon also again. This is their design. Many, several people are, several companies are working on it. Not a lot, but several companies are working on it. And we need to pay attention to this. It's just absolutely ridiculous that we are not doing this in this country. We should be doing this in a big way. Or oh, for lunar power, for space. Um, so my interest is, of course, in space too. Uh, they found thorium on the moon also. And these are some of the places that they found them, the thorium. So if you take one kilogram of thorium from here along with the molten salt reactor, which would be 100 kilogram. It can power, you know, it, as you can see, 2.6 thermal megawatt plant for one year. One kilogram. One kilogram can provide energy of 2.6 thermal megawatt. And what is NASA looking at right now? 40 kilowatt. So this is so much more than what NASA is looking at, and it can be powered with this particular thing. And then later on, it just becomes, you know, self-sustaining on the moon. And uh, the way that we would do it is, is, this is something that I have also designed, which is that you take the second stage of upper stage of a rocket and you allow 
uh, you take out the oxygen tank and instead you use the thorium or any, any other, actually any other nuclear reactor, thorium reactor or any other reactor. And then when you go to the moon or any other place, you repurpose it. You repurpose it for making energy on the moon. And you can do that energy, make the energy on the moon, make electricity on the moon that way by repurposing this portion here. And here it is again, and then you can also heat the molten, the, the regolith on the moon. So you can, you know, do many things with it. Now, finally, China is doing this already. China has announced that they have, they are going to be building a huge, largest ever container ship powered by thorium molten salt reactor. And this is what that is. And we are sitting here and we are not doing anything, twiddling our thumbs, basically. Really silly. And <coughs> this, is, this is something that China has uh, given permission for, for um, uh, their sign up, Shanghai Institute of Applied Physics, to take up and make it operational, this particular type of a molten salt reactor. So all in all, for, real, for US and world terrestrially, thorium offers immense supply of energy that can last several thousand years. No CO2 emissions or pollutants, no high pressure explosion possibility, twice the efficiency of conversion to electricity as PWRs, natural and fail safe freeze valve mechanism, um, less, less than 1% radioactivity, radioactive waste products. No plutonium is produced from this thing. And even in, it can work even in desert. It doesn't have to be near water source. It doesn't require water. So this is really absolutely amazing solution. And it, you don't have to shut it down. It can be continuously and chemically fueled and limit only to US for proliferation, if there is proliferation concern, but there should not be, because the uranium-233 is um, dissolved in, uh, in molten salt, and that you cannot make a bomb out of that. You know? It's just, <laughs> there, are, there are no liquid bombs. Finally, the last is my invitation to everybody to come to the, uh, uh, the closing party of our exhibition, my exhibition, my painting is shown here. Uh, so please, all of you, it's free, you know, <laughs> with wine and cheese. <laughs> so thank you very much. Oh. We're going to have uh, questions here. Thank you so much. Oh, my name is Latham Fell, uh, and my question is for Lloyd Mitchell. Uh, the RNA splicing seems too good to be true, cure for cancer, cure for HIV, AIDS, HIV AIDS. So I guess my question is, what's the catch? Uh, the, the main problem is figuring out the best way to target any particular pre-mRNA. And I should have explained that in the diagram of the pre-mRNA with all the exons and introns present, that's actually incorrect. That it's, it's not a linear molecule at that point. And Generally, not all the introns and exons are there because as the pre-mRNA is copied from the, the DNA, uh, pre-mRNA wants to be double-stranded also. So it folds on itself, and then as the molecule gets extended or copied, uh, the first intron might splice or it might not. So trying to figure out which part of the pre-mRNA is accessible for base pairing is, takes some effort. So that's why we're using bioinformatics and high-throughput screening to find the best region to target. But essentially, you know, all eukaryotes have been splicing their genes since the beginning of eukaryotes, because that's why you have a nucleus, is to keep the unspliced RNA away from the ribosomes. So it's, uh, the mach machinery is already there. It's just, can we har um, utilize it? Richard Talbot. I am a proud member of PSW. And who are you asking a <laughs> question of? Thorium. Thorium's not on oh, the stage, but is not HA. Here. HA is here. 
<laughs> so I pushed the uh, I believe in thorium button a long time ago and have been researching it. And I, I really think that's the way to evolve into the future. And the problem is, well, first off, there was a thorium reactor that was built in the 1940s or 50s. 60s. 60s, okay, we should learn a lot from Alvin that. Weinberg did that in ORNL. Yeah, so, you know, I'm kind of merging this presentation with the DOE presentation from uh, a couple of months ago. And it's very clear to me that the thorium advocates are going to have to unseat an established technology area. And that is not an easy thing to do. You can just look at the electric vehicles today and see the kind of problems they have and how much money had to be put behind electric vehicles uh, to still not be successful, okay? Start adding it up somewhere. But the problem is, is government should be duty bound to implement technology that is safer for mankind. Right. Yeah. And the uh, cost of this uh, technology and the availability of the fuel and all the beautiful things that you've pointed out, I never considered converting a, uh, a rocket engine over to providing <laughs> energy on the moon. What a clever idea. I mean, that was really question? great stuff. Question? The, a question? Yeah, yes, question. I'm sorry. <laughs> too too much enthusiasm. Spe speeches, but <laughs> so I, I was just wondering, how are you making that transition to literally engage the established base? Well, uh, I really don't know the answer to that. Actually, you know, I'm trying to do the best I can to uh, allow the public uh, to, you know, educate, and and I thank Larry for giving us a, giving me a sort of a, a ground here to be able to do that. But you're right. It's, uh, you know, we want electric vehicles. I want electric vehicles. But where is that electricity going to come from? It cannot come from fuel cells. That's all nonsense. I'm sorry. It cannot come from coal-fired plant and, you know, any fossil fuel plant. It has to come from nuclear. And that nuclear is molten salt reactor, which is the best, the safest way to do this nuclear uh, thing. That, that solves, okay, so, this so solves so many problems. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Okay, the answer to your question is get yourself a billionaire who is willing <laughs> to put the money in to make it happen. And there are a couple of billionaires in the space, right? There are a couple of um, efforts to do small modular nuclear reactors and other kinds of reactors, exotic fueled by billionaires. So why are they not tuned into this uh, excellent I idea? Uh, that's, you know, I've been trying to do some things with the Silicon Valley crowd and other places and, and, and like that, but uh, people just don't seem to realize the, the amazing things, amazing things that this thing brings to the table. They don't seem to realize that. And I, you know, you try to tell them, but there is a time lag of a year or two before it will just sink in completely. And I have a feeling that probably in a year or two or something like that, many of these people are going to put in so much money into this thing that it's amazing. It'll be quite amazing. But I think Department of Energy needs to give out small contracts to do the research and development work on this to get those people excited also, which Department of Energy is not doing. And you mentioned... Uh, 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 let's take another question. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Well, no, I'm just one, let me finish. Katie Up, who came here a month ago or something like that, she mentioned other all other reactors, but not, did not mention the thorium molten salt reactor in that. And that's a mistake. Blue microphone. Yes. Uh, name? My name is Frederica Darima. I'm PSF and I also want to follow up with this discussion on the... So oh. what I was saying is, of course, I'm supportive of uh, thorium-based uh, energy, and I share kind of your uh, concerns that we are not having any significant efforts. My question was, Arriva in France is a, always a very progressive company in terms of nuclear energy. Do they have any efforts? I, not so, that I know of. You know. I'll repeat the question. There's a, a French company, Arriva. Yes. Is that the French uh, National Nuclear Energy 
outfit. Right. And Maybe the question is, are they doing anything with Thorium? Uh, not that I know of. The companies which are doing something in this thing are in, in Netherlands and uh, Denmark. Uh, those are the two places. Uh, French are doing a lot of, uh, obviously, fast neutron breeder uh, reactor issues and stuff, but not Thorium, as far as I know. As, as I guess probably everybody knows, the French electrical grid is a huge component of uh, its electricity provided by nuclear power. Yeah, about 70%. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, really high. And they have a very advanced uh, nuclear power program. But it's all right. PWRs, I think. Yes. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, yeah. Lloyd would like to ask a question. AJ. Would you please stand up, tell us your name, and if you're a oh. member. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, when, when will the with uh, one speaker to the other? Okay. <laughs> when would the uh, Chinese ship be functional? And that might provide the evidence that's needed. Uh, I think that they said that it'll still be six years or something like that before it becomes available. Actually, Norway has another ship that they have designed also based on thorium molten salt reactor, which can not only power itself, but it also can create electricity to be able to power cruise ships. You know, go there, attach yourself to the cruise ship and, and uh, transfer the power, you know, so. We have some questions for the web and then we'll come back to the microphones. Uh, first question is for Lloyd. Uh, could CRISPR be used to target an addiction gene? <laughs> um, um, undoubtedly, um, <clears throat> again, the CRISPR requires the Cas molecule, which is quite large, and so delivering that to enough neurons in the brain might be difficult. Uh, second question for AJ. Uh, could you please uh, could you explain the difference between fission and fusion? Oh, <laughs> well, that's an easy one. <laughs> well, <laughs> fission usually occurs with uh, with uh, elements which are in the actinide series, which are near the end of the periodic table, bottom of the periodic table, where the neutron numbers are so high that it's more likely that they are going to be unstable. And so if you put one more neutron, you know, um, one more neutron in it, in it, it's likely that it'll split uh, uranium is uranium-235 is one of those. Uranium-233 is another one, and plutonium is the third one. Those are the ones which are all in actinide series in the bottom. In terms of fusion, it's the opposite, which is where you go to the top. And of course, you know what is released during the fission process is the binding energy of the neutron because all the protons that it has, this one has 90 protons, thorium. So they cannot be all together. Otherwise, you know, they hate each other, right? <laughs> so <laughs> they'll split apart. So there is obviously a theorized nuclear, powerful nuclear force, um, you know, short distance force, and that's holding things together with those neutrons. So that's, it is what is released. And there is also, of course, a little bit of a, 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 a difference in mass, total mass. That is mass equal to EM. Um, mc square, uh, I'm sorry, energy equal to mc square there where you lose that mass, that is being generated. In fusion is the opposite, which is where two hydrogen or deuterium atoms or hydrogen and deuterium get together and then they combine the weight of that which becomes helium is, is, uh, uh, is you know, obviously less, uh, uh, the helium weight is less. So some energy is released there also. And that energy is actually uh, almost, you know, it's a, it's a similar, similar amount, except that per, if you look at per kilogram of hydrogen, hydrogen is much obviously much uh, uh, lighter. And so that number becomes larger, but otherwise the energy released, these are, Primordial elements that have been given to us, gifted to us by God, take advantage of them. That's the fission. These are primordial elements, which is thorium, which is um, uranium, etc. 
that are the only ones that can fission, only ones that can fission and only ones that can create energy, take advantage of that, human beings, and, and, and uh, you know. On a less metaphysical level, I'm not sure at what level the questioner was asking the question, so I'm going to venture a simpler explanation. <laughs> I'm not as technically astute or knowledgeable. So uh, nuclei tend to like to go, like everybody else, to what is the least energetic state. But there are barriers. So if you fuse two hydrogen atoms and you end up with a helium atom, if you do it properly, it releases energy because the helium nucleus is at a lower energy than the two hydrogen atoms were to begin with. But you have to overcome the energy barrier to do that. On the other end of the scale, you know, you're tending towards the middle here, uh, uranium, um, it would be happier if it split. That is to say, if it fissioned. And it would release energy because the resulting nuclei are at a lower energy. So they release energy. And somewhere in the middle is where things don't like to split or fuse anymore. But basically, fission is the process of breaking apart in a situation where you're releasing energy and fusion is a process of joining together in a situation where you release energy as a result of the joining. So fission means breaking up, fusion means putting together. Okay, that's my kindergarten kind of explanation. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take a question from the web with a blue microphone, Andrew. All right, um, this last question is for Scott. I believe they're referring to one of your figures. Um, they ask, does the amplitudehedron come from quantum fields? Does the amplitude what? The amplitudehedron come from quantum fields. I believe that might be referring to one of your figures that you were showing. No, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what that is, and I think it was in my presentation. Okay. So maybe the questioner can, can clarify their question. Uh, I'm Andrew Burbank. Uh, this is for Scott. I'm not a member. Actually, I have two questions for Scott. Uh, the first is you said that you've seen this branch crossing in multiple material systems now. Uh, do you have any hypotheses as to why certain materials exhibit this and certain do not? And then the second one is can you foresee any applications for this branch crossing? Okay, let me take the second question first. Um, this is a question that I get asked all the time. I think that the most correct short answer is no. I don't know what the application of this is. Um, there are a couple possibilities for applications. Uh, the first one would be in magnetic sensors. Um, I'm very interested in the possibility of using these materials in a flux gate magnetometer um, because I think that this this sharp change in slope in the curve could potentially increase the sensitivity of a, of a, of a type of a flux gate magnetometer. Um, there are a couple of other uh, ideas that we've thought of in terms of applications which actually relate back to your first question. So there are a couple of other ideas um, that don't directly exploit the hysteresis branch crossing itself but could potentially exploit the conditions under which the hysteresis branch crossing takes place. My, my best guess, my best understanding at this point, what is required in order to see a hysteresis branch crossing is one, to have a strong anisotropy, okay, so that if you, if you measure the magnitude of what we call the anisotropy field, that it would have a large value, so a strong anisotropy, and that the second thing that is necessary is a very, very well-defined anisotropy. So when I talk about anisotropies, I can, I can have a little magnetic particle like, like the little ellipsoid that I showed. And that one little ellipsoid has a single anisotropy field. That field is determined by the ratio of the long axis to the short axis. And it has a single anisotropy orientation. And the orientation is determined by the angle at which that ellipsoid is is oriented at. In all real macroscopically large samples, there are going to be millions upon millions upon millions of little magnetic particles. And all of those particles are not going to have identically the exact same anisotropy field. There will be some distribution in the magnitude of the field. 
Additionally, all of those little particles are not, even if you orient them, even if you use some technique to get the samples to all orient in one direction, they are not perfectly geometrically aligned. There is always some finite distribution of the uh, anisotropy axis. And so what we think is critical to seeing the anisotropy is, uh, I'm sorry, to seeing the histories as branch crossing, is that the anisotropy is strong, that the anisotropy is nearly single valued, and that the anisotropy has nearly a single orientation. Where the application comes in is that what we've shown through more recent work is that we can, we can calculate the magnitude of the anisotropy that we're going to get beforehand. We can engineer, we can dial in whatever anisotropy we want by controlling the conditions under which we make this, this sample. And because anisotropy is so important in magnetic devices, we believe that that control of the anisotropy may lead us to a lot of very interesting applications. Those applications wouldn't actually involve the hysteresis branch crossing, but the conditions of a strong, well-defined anisotropy would allow these applications. Is there a microphone out there? Ah, blue microphone. Okay, Mike Moore, I am a member. Uh, I was going to ask Dr. Matthews about anisotropy, but I'm not going to anymore. What I am going to do is uh, ask Dr. Mitchell, uh, your treatment systems uh, that you're coming up with are all really dependent upon being able to target known gene defects. Is there a use for your uh, particular technology in actually finding uh, various defects that aren't necessarily known today. Thank you. Uh, that's kind of a tough one, although, you know, if you use uh, the, this approach for doing molecular imaging, you might be able to then functionally look at the expression of different genes in different animal model systems or in patients. But uh, there are probably better ways to find which genes are causing diseases that are so far not attributed to a particular genetic disease. Um, gene editing works best when you know what your target is, mm -hmm. and then you try and figure out what's the best way to rewrite that gene and get a therapeutic outcome. Uh, Mr. <laughs> uh, how radical is this retrotherapy in, in terms of its acceptance and, and is it part of the, the government's, you know, moonshot against cancer? And to what extent are you able to leverage AI? Uh, that's a complicated question, but um, we've had a number of grants from both uh, the state of Maryland and the, the U.S. NIH um, that have uh, we've got worked on. So, like for Huntington's disease, uh, we developed a transplacing molecule for that under that grant. Um, initially, uh, you know, since I invented the technology, we were the only company in this, this area. There's now probably five or six companies working on this. Uh, we have a pharmaceutical partner in Japan. There's another company called Acidian that's uh, based in Boston that has, it's owned by a venture capital fund. They have about $100 million uh, behind them. And they're the ones who will be filing, they say, uh, for an IND. That means to enter human clinical trials this year for a genetic form of blindness. AI. Uh, I think oh, AI, yes. So, so we're not using AI yet, but um, we're, we're using bioinformatics. And we have a, a partnership that may be starting very shortly with the University of Maryland. They have a, a new institute, even though we all went to Maryland. <laughs> called the Institute for Health Computing, which will be looking at um, particular genes that we're interested in and trying to help locate which part of that pre-mRNA might be the best to base pair with and target to get the transplacing reaction to occur more frequently and specifically. I think you could honestly say it's been an uphill battle. Yes. Um, I mean, in terms of the competition, CRISPR, you know, before CRISPR, a time we called BC, nobody cared about gene editing. 
Uh, CRISPR got the world very interested in it. It's gotten Nobel Prizes. Um, they've gotten billions of dollars, and they just recently had a couple of therapies approved by the FDA. They're a couple million dollars each, and uh, they have to be done with cells that are taken from the patient, treated in a factory, and then put back in them. Um, you know, it's, it's shown that editing can work, but the, the, the players in the field have sort of gotten a very low return on their investments, and so now they're looking for other forms of technology that might achieve the same goals um, more efficiently. Blue microphone. Hello, my name is Undine Nash. I'm a member. I'm a former, should I get up? Uh, I'm a former microbiologist. My question is to Naijai Kodadi. Uh, every, I really loved how you uh, contradicted the uh, all kinds of form of energy generation and all the disadvantages compared to the thorium. But everybody is talking now about hydrogen, particularly if it's so-called green hydrogen. And I'm not a physicist, but I cannot imagine how you can contain the smallest atoms ever in, in big caverns under, underground and so on. Would you please elaborate a little bit of the disadvantages of uh, hydrogen energy? Yeah. Um, OK. Oh, OK. Um, it's. Um, Hydrogen has, a, of course, hydrogen has a big problem, which is that its density is 68 kilograms per meter cube um, for liquid hydrogen, that is. You know. For gaseous hydrogen, it's even obviously much worse than that. So you have to then contain that hydrogen in highly pressurized tanks if you want to use them in vehicles or any other place like that. Highly pressurized, you know. Um, and so then what happens is the hydrogen atom molecule is very, very the smallest, obviously. It seeps through from intermolecular inter space. And we, in my hypersonic and rocket uh, world, we ran into that problem all the time, that uh, it just leaks through all the seals. And, and, uh, and, and that's the reason for the boil-off problem that hydrogen has in space that you lose a lot of hydrogen per uh, liquid hydrogen per day. And the same thing happens with uh, gaseous hydrogen also. So hydrogen now, you know, as you could see here from some of the charts, there are some um, uh, generation four reactors, which, I, which are called high temperature gas, uh, gas reactor and uh, another one. Both of them are extremely high temperature and you know they can because of that temperature they can actually um, electrolyze not electrolyze but you know get hydrogen from water easily and then that's one of the things that they can do that has been suggested as a potential for the generation four but I don't really believe in hydrogen that much. No, I think neither do you. Okay, I, I yeah. think it has to be said hydrogen's not looked at as a means for producing energy. It requires energy to produce hydrogen. It's looked at as a kind of a storage medium. So people talk about doing uh, fuel cells using hydrogen in place of batteries. But hydrogen has to be generated somehow. And when they say green hydrogen, what they're talking about is using some green energy, like wind power or sunlight or in this case, a nuclear reactor that operates at very high temperature to, to generate hydrogen. But I will, yeah. I will tell you, if you go back and look at the history of electric cars, as soon as an electric car manufacturing takes, gets some traction, the next thing that they drag out is hydrogen. And the state of, no. state of California got sold that bill of goods back when the EV1 was a fairly popular model, and it ended up uh, that GM took it off the market because they'd rather sell gas cars. And, and the um, idea that you were going to have uh, hydrogen-powered cars never took off. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that again, but I don't think it's going to go anywhere because it's just it's a kind of ridiculous idea, really. But yep. we'll see. You know, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a prophet. I can tell you what happened in the past. I can't tell you what's going to happen in the future. Right. Um, any other questions? Okay.
Well, then let's thank our three speakers. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Yes. thank you very much for all your attention. In keeping with recent tradition, we have some gifts for our speakers. Yeah, believe it or not. Each of you gets a plaque uh, with the announcement of your talk. I've, I've customized them, so it's the same for everybody on top, but each one of you is individualized as to your bio and the subject of your lecture. And that will be framed copy. There's a frame there. And it actually exists over here if anybody wants to see it. You also all get a, a ribbon. And I know some of you have one, but we might give you another one anyway. And you get a copy of a Bulletin, Volume 1, of the Bulletin of Philosophical Society of Washington, in which you will find the reasons the society was formed, why it was named the Philosophical Society of Washington, who the founders were, including Joseph Henry and John Wesley Powell, and early reports on meetings, including discussions of expeditions to view the transit of Venus, Mercury, to measure the size of the solar system, the new monetary system of Japan, and a method to calculate pi to 30 decimal places. So, thank you all very, very much. Before you go, before the audience goes, you guys can leave the stage now. And there are a few closing announcements. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be at the 2490th meeting on February 9th. The speaker will be Bartek Rajwa. He will be speaking on unmasking food fraud with biophysics and the use of food fingerprinting technologies to validate food provenance, authenticity, quality, and safety. Bartek is research professor at Purdue University in the Bindley Bioscience Center. The 2,491st meeting will be on February 23rd. The speaker topic, as you can see, it be determined, however I am, in conversations with Nima R. Kenny Hamed, and he's agreed to do two things. One is to uh, have one of his graduate students present her work, which he thinks is, is very good, with him. And they will have a dialogue about how they work together to produce this work that she will be presenting. And I thought that would be very interesting and fun because if you're like me, you really have no idea how theoretical physicists go about collaborating with one another or developing new ideas. So I thought that would be a lot of fun. And hopefully he will agree to do this on February 23rd. Nima gave the lecture at the 2384th meeting on December 1, 2017. His lecture, called The Doom of, Sp the Doom of Space Time, has been viewed over 200,000 times on YouTube. The 2492nd meeting will be on March 15th. The speaker will be Eric Klein, also a person who gave a talk before. He's at George Mason University. I'm sorry, he's at George Washington University. As many of you know, Eric is an archeologist who's written many books on the Mediterranean Bronze Age, civilizations, and on their collapse. He previously spoke at the 2,351st meeting on October 9th, 2015, on Sailing the Wine Dark Seas, his book on the collapse of the Bronze Age civilization. His video, the video of that talk, has been viewed over 46,000 times. The 2,494th meeting will be on April 5th. Again, the topic is to be, ah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Yes, this is the, where Nemo may give his solo talk, hopefully. The 2495th meeting will be on April 15th. The speaker will be David Spurgle. He's a physicist and the current president of the Simons Foundation. He chaired the panel on UAPs and likely will be speaking about unidentified area phenomena. Some people think he's going to reveal the vast conspiracy that has covered these things up. And other people think he's going to have a short, sweet talk because they're is nothing there. We'll see. The 2497th meeting will be the annual Joseph Henry dinner and lecture on May 17th, and I hope the speaker will be Dante Loretta, who is the principal investigator of Osiris Rex, which just brought back samples from Bennu, the asteroid Bennu, 
and that capsule has been opened and we should have results that he can talk about. The 2498th talk hopefully will be Masahara Subakura on the Fukushima natural nuclear, quote, disaster and its public health effects. Uh, he's a Japanese scientist who spent a lot of time, well, actually a public health official, spent a lot of time looking into uh, the damage and the harm in terms of health that um, resulted from what happened at Fukushima. I won't spoil it with what he found, but you can look him up. The 2499th talk will be by Mike Griffin, former NASA administrator and currently co-CEO of Logic. And his talk is yet to be determined, but I imagine it has something to do with critiquing the Artemis program. We will post everything to the website as soon as we have firm commitments. And with that, let's thank the people who helped produce tonight's meeting. Thank you. Please return name badges to the plastic bins in the back, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn the 2,489th meeting. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I am. All in favor? All opposed? Meeting is unanimously adjourned to the social hour.